of Watergate is that we must not just settle for a change in the palace guard. We have to demand fundamental changes in the way power is distributed in our society. And we are doing it. And that means that we must have genuinely open government, open to the ideas and talents of all segments of our population, certainly open to the majority of our people and especially to women. We must seek not only to have more women, we must seek to have more young people and more minorities in government so that we can return real compassion and understanding of people's needs to Washington, which has been totally lacking in these last many years. But the one central lesson of Watergate that we must cling to is that despite the attempted subversion of our democracy, we, the people, all of us, are still sovereign. And we, the people, include women. This is our country. We, many of us, have borne its children. We, many of us, have worked in its homes. We've worked in its farms. We've worked in its factories. We've fought for its changes. We've fought against its mistakes. We think that we have a right to participate in its economic and political resources. We think we have an obligation and a responsibility to the generations that many of us have helped to create to see that we provide a future for our people in this country and for the people all over this world. And we feel and know that if we could have some power, we could organize and fight for these rights, and we could guarantee the fulfillment of needs, and we could make this government and its institutions work for us, the women, work for us, the people in this country, and work for humanity all over this world. And I think we will find that winning with women means winning for all of us men and women alike. Thank you very much. Our next speaker has not had many of the advantages of those of us in this room, but that has not kept her from rising to the top. Johnny Tillman was a welfare recipient for nine years in California. In 1963, she founded the first welfare rights group in Watts. She has become the founder and the chairperson of the National Welfare Rights Organization. In 1973, she was named its executive director. In the past year, she has been on educational leave at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she has developed a fundraising project for the National Welfare Rights Organization to make it a self-supporting group. They hope to do this by raising 50 cents from 12 and a half million people. And I think this is quite a goal to try to achieve. Our next speaker, Johnny Tillman, Executive Director of the National Welfare Rights Organization. Thank you, and 
Good morning. <laughs> I had to look at my watch because I have afternoon. I have Washington time. Uh, I want to assure you that you're not going to hear a long, raving, dynamic speech because I am not a speaker. I consider myself an organizer. And organizers don't have to do a lot of speaking. <laughs> the thing I thought was most appropriate, sometime I find a lot of people don't know what welfare is. And so I thought I'd do a little research and bring you up on a little history. The Elizabeth Poor Law, Elizabeth Poor Laws of England established welfare practice in colonial America. They were enacted to protect townspeople from the poor and the destitute. The colonists believed that the extreme failure in living conditions were morally weak and sinful, and therefore protection against such a mess was necessary. It was common practice to auction able-bodied poor to farmers and to put the mentally ill, the disabled, the homeless children in poor houses. They were regarded as being beyond redemption. These poor laws of 1601 established welfare practices did not change until 1934, over 300 years later. In 1921, attempt by the federal government to participate in social welfare programs through Maternity and Infancy Act to deal with the high rate of infancy death failed when the act was not renewed. Many people did not approve of the federal aid for such programs, including the American Medical Association, who opposed the act as the beginning of socialized medicine. The crash of the New York exchange, Stock Exchange in October 1929 and the following of Great Depression marked the beginning for the need to change the methods of American social welfare. With the economic depression and widespread despair, the plight of the poor became the plight of major America. The masses of unemployed, the homeless families could no longer justify its Peruan values and worth ethics. In 1933, with the election of President Roosevelt, the federal government took great temporary steps toward responsibility with Federal Emergency, Re Emergency Release Act, such as some of you might remember the WPA, the NYA, and et cetera. In 1935, the first permanent step was took by the federal government to provide security against the great unfortunate factors of life. When the Social Security Act became law, hence the fundamental federal law in the field of social welfare in the United States was created, but not without great struggle against many people whose attitude was still more in keeping with the Elizabethan poor laws of 1601. There are still people in America today who believe that welfare practices by the colonial Americans are more desirable today than the development of the fundamental federal law concept of the social welfare programs. One asks questions. What is social welfare? What is it all about? Well, we say it's about federal old age insurance, federal state unemployment compensation, old age assistance, aid to the blind, aid to the families with dependent children, the supplementary social security uh, income, vocational rehabilitation, public health services. With such programs and services, what went wrong? The ideal, the U.S. government had reached the first step in its history of maturing, a government of people by the people. For the people would assume responsibility for the preservation of the welfare of all its people. On a large scale, this had meant preservations of the countries, the country against enemies, perseverance and catastrophes. On a smaller scale, there would now mean preservations for an individual against poverty and ignorance. The history, if we just take a glance at American history, it clearly shows that the behavior of the American people have been the biggest obstacle for obtaining the ideal. And the reality, 
greed for power and money, red tape in the bureaucracy, the encouragement of racism, exploitation of the unfortunate have been the American way of life that is real. As long as the idea was impossible, an impossible goal, reality could be ignored and the welfare system would fail. And so, a few years ago, a movement was started when people faced repression with loss of dignity and itself in the system, their lot become a choice, surrender and become dehumanized or stand together mm -hmm. and fight. And hence, a stand to fight become a movement. 1963, 64, 65, small unrelated groups of people were subject to failure of the welfare system, set up challenges across the country, demonstrations, court suits, confrontation, and community action. By 1966, the group began to come together around common interests they shared, recognition of their human rights, their rights as an American citizen, the rights of their total welfare, national leadership was developed. And in 1967, more than 5,000 5, welfare recipients in 40 cities became united under the banner of the National Welfare Rights Organization. Our membership stands today around 125,000 or more. I'm always kind of careful about not giving an exact figure because that's not uh, too cool sometimes. <laughs> so one have asked us, people have asked us rather than many, many, many times, what rights do you have? You are a disgrace to the, to the nation. You're lazy and you're shiftless and you want something for nothing. And you sit down and you take most of my tax dollar. And you have babies on purpose just to get on welfare. And since I'm talking to a group of women today, I'm sure that you here don't have that kind of concept. Because anybody knows that you don't have a child on purpose, you don't get pregnant and go nine months sick most of the time, don't know whether you're going to make it off the delivery table, going to be bothered with it for the rest of its life and your life <laughs> for no five dollars a month increase in your check. <laughs> and so we came up with a bill of rights and when you ask the question what rights do you have we say that we have a right to be a member of the organization because many people were told they could not participate into the welfare rights organization. Many welfare recipients were threatened to be cut their checks taken away if they had part, took part in the organization. A lot of our people were told that the organization was communist and communist inspired. And that used to worry me since I organized the first group and <laughs> communists, I, I couldn't imagine who, who the communist people were who inspired me to organize. <laughs> and so, one, one day I came up with some names, and I was very proud to be communist inspired organization, because the names on my list included Ronald Reagan's, <laughs> Russell Long, <laughs> Wilbur Mills, Richard Nixon, and at that time, Lyndon Bain Johnson and a whole lot of other guys on Capitol Hill. And so when they tell me now that we're communist inspired, I said, that's right, they are the communists and they inspire us. <laughs> there are a lot of myths about people on welfare. And some of the myths are that we live good that we got colored TVs <laughs> and that we have Cadillacs. <laughs> and I used to be told that I couldn't go over on Capitol Hill clean, that I had to go ragged and dirty. And I've been told that you don't look like a welfare recipient. And I didn't understand how I was supposed to look as a welfare recipient. 
The fact that I come out of the backwoods of Arkansas, we were taught at least you had to take a bath once a week. <laughs> and that you had to have on clean clothes even to go to the field where I come from. So being poor to me was not an excuse for being dirty. But we have all these kind of <laughs> concepts. The National Welfare Rights Organization was primarily a woman's organization. And so we got to thinking one day that maybe we had better expand the organization. Because the bulk of the membership is women in the AFDC category. And when you're in the AFDC category, you can't, you can't, you're not eligible for that particular category unless you have children. And you can't have children unless male are involved. And so we open up our organization to the male. But it's controlled by women, the very small percent. Our organization is not a all-black organization. It's Johnny Tillman and a few other people are black, and we can't do nothing about that. We don't really want to do nothing about that. We have Chicanos, Indians, whatever have you. Whoever fits into the categorical aid, low income and no co income, are open. we are open to your membership. You can be a part of the organization. Some of the myths is that all of the welfare people are black. That's not true. Six percent in the AFDC category are white. They're white women with no fathers in the home with children. That does seem kind of odd due to the fact that black folks have supposed to have all, most of the babies for the last 400 years that we didn't catch up yet. <laughs> so something must be wrong, or even that myth is not true. There have been tales told that people journey from one state to another, from southern states to northern states, just to get on welfare. We find that impossible. We can't see how a mother of seven children in the state of Mississippi getting $70 a month can come to California in the first place, not even on a Greyhound bus. <laughs> Most of our mothers are overweight. We have obesity problems with diabetics and what have you, about 80% of us. Because that has something to do with the kinds of food that we have to eat. And could you believe that there are some women now, middle class women, are paid to come out and tell us how to budget the welfare check. To me, that's a waste of money. Now, I, I accept women doing something, but they certainly don't need to tell me how to budget $355 with five kids when the rent is already <laughs> outlined and what have you. We do not buy the color TVs. It's very easy to give to television because the businessmen in America itself thrive off of the poor. These men will set a color TV in your house with no down payment and charge you $10 a month. And he come by every first of the month and cash the check. He, pay, he follows the mailman. And as the mailman dropped the check, he don't carry no furniture that day. He only carries enough money and a receipt book to take care of the money business. So he come back next week with the merchandise. But as the mailman dropped the check, he goes in and cash it for you. She never has to leave the house because he get his $10 off of the top. The supermarkets usually put big sales on for us. Every two weeks, our folks get our checks in most states every two weeks, 1st and 15th. 1st and 15th, there's a big sale, especially in the check receiving communities. There are a difference. Even though we have some recipients in Burbank, California, and a little small strip down in Beverly Hills, you won't believe that. But we have some people there in need. And otherwise, we wouldn't have built that great big building out there. Uh, on Beverly Drive uh, if we didn't have welfare recipients in that area. But the supermarkets do put on big sales, make a lot of money, and we go there in lines. They also have a check cashing system where they charge us 25 cents for cashing our checks. 
And of course, you can't spend the 25. They give you, they don't give you the money. They give you, you give you a little coupon. And they'll cash the check. You take the coupon, but you have to spend it in the store. Those are the kinds of things that we are subject to. The fact that, that uh, we're lazy and shiftless kind of people, that's also a myth too. You can find lazy people in all walks of life. Don't necessarily have to be lazy, but just don't want to work. <laughs> don't feel like working. And I think folk ought to have a choice about that. 60% of our total mothers in the AFDC category are now in training programs or have jobs. These jobs are usually low paying jobs and sometimes have to be supplemented by the welfare department. But that doesn't, that woman, keep the, they keep these jobs and they don't come home and just sit out on the welfare check. In many instances, the welfare, getting welfare aid, take a lot of dignity from the person. And I think that's why we had a welfare rights organization in the first place, because we got tired of being, after living on our mothers and fathers and they dictating to us for so many years. When we had to come on welfare, we also had to be dictated by, by, to, by the social worker. They came early in the morning. They come unannounced. We used to have something called midnight raids. I don't know whether you guys have been raiding out here or not. But a midnight raid is where at midnight a knock is on the door. And when you open the door, there's a man standing there. Incidentally, they changed it in some places. They got women standing there now. But a man is standing there, and he holds his badge. And he asks you, would you let his partner in the back door? And when you open the back door, there is a man there. And they come to search the house. They, come, they would look under the beds, in the refrigerator. I don't know who's supposed to be in the refrigerator, but they would look <laughs> in the refrigerator, in the washing machine, in the clothes closet. What they were looking for was men. And sometimes it would be the father or the recipient, not of the children. A father couldn't come, visit, come and visit his daughter unless he had to show identification, his driver's license, or whatever he had in his wallet. And so I think some of that is the reason why we have a, a national welfare rights organization. We've been able to cut some of that kind of stuff out in most of our cities. Another thing we moved a little bit because we didn't understand about the politics of this nation. And I assume from hearing everybody talk this morning, this is what you're all about, off into the politics. And I'm sure that you wouldn't be off into the politics except you wanted some change about something. It does not have to be about welfare. We would hope that you would give that a thought, a thought rather. I'm sure that a lot of you out there are on welfare. If you're not on welfare, you need to be on welfare. And you shouldn't be ashamed to go and ask for it because it's your money. So we made visits, visits on Capitol Hill. We were stormed in some offices. And it doesn't matter to us in welfare rights who's in office, whether it's Republicans or Democrats. They all give us hell. You know, it does not matter to us. And so in our organization now, we are undertaking some great steps in the political arena ourselves. We are about educating and orientating our own people. We are getting involved in voters' registration and voters' education. We have some candidates running from the National Welfare Rights Organization. There's a mayor in a little city with 600 people, but she's a mayor in Taft, Oklahoma. We had a sister to run in uh, Wisconsin for mayor uh, in one of the small cities there. Right now in Las Vegas, Nevada, one of our mothers and representatives is running against a union man in her own district for the assembly seat. And in Louisiana, this past few months, we are Gil Russell Long a run for his life. <laughs> Russell Long has been in office for 26 years. For the first time since he was first elected, he had billboards along the highways. He never had to spend any money because nobody would ever run. This year, we made him spend $250,000 <laughs> in 
in the black community. Because our candidate was a 51-year-old, 250-pound black mother of 13 from the Welfare Rights Organization. less than $2,000 because we didn't have it to spend. Our deficit now is $1,500 and Mr. Long spent $250,000. Annie Smart pulled 45,605 votes statewide with less than $2,000. We consider this progress. So the young lady who introduced me, she told you about my plan to raise six and a quarter of a million dollars. And we plan to do that by asking 12 and a half million people to give us one fifty cents, not 50 cents a month, 50 cents a year, one fifty cents across the, across the board, and you can pay it out in installments, 25 cents every six months. <laughs> One of the reasons we're doing that is because our organization have always had to depend on foundations, on church groups, and on individuals. And we appreciate that. But a lot of times, it ties our hands from moving on. You know, we can't talk about our views on abortions, because some of our groups are funded by the Catholic Charities. Uh, we can't talk about uh, running, putting some money into somebody's campaign because the, the foundation's 5013C exempts from that. And so that kind of ties us in one place and we deliver the services, which is very needed to people, but we also need to go farther. So with six and a quarter of a million dollars, Annie Smart can win next time. Because if she can poll 45000 with $1,500 with $50,000, I think we can win it. <laughs> so before I sit down, I'd like to share just a little bit of a little poem with you. And it goes like this. And I think it might be appropriate for today. It says, this world is not like it used to be. Just look around and you would see. Things we thought could never be. I think the change is in you and me. And sure, we have black and white, but we also have day and night. So we can take a firm stand and walk this land hand in hand. The answer is not so hard to find. All you got to do is make up your mind. This world will be a beautiful place, you see, and all it takes is you and me. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Jones is a Rockefeller Fellow in Film and Modern Media. She has been a consultant to CBS on the documentary Misunderstanding China. She is also a member of the United States Children's Bureau and has been a guest of the Women's Federation of China. She will speak for a few minutes on Can Women Keep the Peace? I am very happy to be here today, and particularly so because one of our most active and enthusiastic members who has been the co-chairman of our organization nationally for many years comes from this state. Her name is Donna Reed. Also, I am happy to be here 
for another and more serious grave reason. We have just had some shocking news that makes it clear that the women of America have an urgent and important job to do. And I can think of no better place than here in the heartland of America, and particularly here at the Iowa Women's Caucus, Political Caucus, to launch the all-out effort which women must make for peace. Just two weeks ago, Dr. Fred C. Ickley, who is the director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency of our country, made an historic speech in Chicago. And you each have received a copy of it, and I hope when you get home that you will read it very carefully, because it is the speech of the decade, which is going to make an enormous difference in our lives. The startling thing that Dr. Eccles revealed is that AEC experts have stumbled accidentally on the fact that nuclear testing in the atmosphere has impaired the ozone layer around the Earth. They have measured a 4% reduction in the ozone layer from the nuclear tests that were carried on in the world during the early 1960s. Now, as you probably know, the, the ozone layer around the Earth is the protective shield. It protects all living things from the killing rays of the sun. And the director of our Arms Control and Disarmament Agency warns us that large nuclear explosions may destroy completely or partially this ozone layer around the Earth and bring an end to life on Earth. Dr. Ickley underscores the fact, and this can make us all extremely angry, that this awesome truth was uncovered just by chance. We have been testing nuclear weapons components for 30 years. And it is only in the last eight months, following up some research that was done on the SST and its effect on the stratosphere, that it occurred to the top nuclear scientists of the world to consider the effects of nuclear bombs on the planet as a whole, as it hangs there in space rather than looking and trying to estimate how many millions of children and women and men would be killed in the United States and in, in Soviet Union and in other countries from the devastating effect of an exchange of nuclear weapons. Such frightening innocence on the part of the wisest scientists when it comes to an understanding of the full meaning of nuclear weapons is indeed a revelation, and we have produced thousands of nuclear weapons. Dr. Ickles gives us an example, and he gives example after example, of how weapons which the scientists put off were either, their effects were either grossly miscalculated or totally unpredicted. And he tells us quite simply, and I quote, the effects of nuclear explosions are too complex for our scientists to predict. And yet, we continue making, manufacturing three hydrogen bombs a day, and the Russians keep pace with us. And we are well on our way to acquiring 10 or 12,000 independently targeted warheads on our submarines, on our strategic bomber force, and on our land-based missiles. And each warhead has a destruction potential 
to the devastating destruction that was wrought at Nagasaki. There is great danger, and we have to face it. A nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union in any of the months ahead or the years ahead could happen through an administrative error, someone who accidentally or purposely on let's go with a nuclear weapon. It could happen by technological failure from weapons released accidentally or purposely by a third nation because there are a growing number of nuclear nations or, and this is quite possible, by terrorists. As I see it, there is no way but for the women of America, because we are the largest nuclear power and we have an open society in this country and we can communicate with each other within our society and we can communicate with other nations and peoples. We cannot wait. We must begin today in order to save our families, to save our children and their children from destruction. We must act to see that there is no more business as usual. General Motors has to sell cars and to keep in business. And the makers of Pentagon products do the same. And war profits are without honor in this desperate time. There is no more politics as usual. I am here to tell you that some members of Congress who spend our tax dollars on nuclear weapon systems own stock in the companies. I am here to tell you that others get military pensions and receive reserve pay from the armed services whose budgets as they pass upon. And the large military corporations, as which Bella referred to in her speech, sit astride our Department of Defense. Almost every secretary, undersecretary, assistant secretary, deputy secretary of defense, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, who has responsibility for weapons procurement and for the research and development of future weapons which they keep on making because of the money, the huge contracts involved, have come to that position directly from the large multinational corporations, Lockheed, IT&T, Rockwell International, General Electric, and the others. And they were board members, they were officers, they were executives of these companies, and they have come into our government to get contracts for their companies. And this is a military Watergate, and it is something that we cannot stand for. Arnold Toynbee was right when he said, the Pentagon has yet to hear from the mothers of America. And I say he has yet to hear from the women of America. There must be no more proliferation of nuclear materials, which is being done right now by well-known companies that we know and are familiar to us because we buy their appliances. Westinghouse and General Electric have been spreading nuclear power plants all over the world. And as we learned from the Indian tests, these nuclear power plants give nuclear weapons capability. The Indian government exploded a nuclear bomb from the fuel, the spent fuel of their plant in May of this year. But above all, and I think this is something that this caucus could do before we disband. Most important of all, we must immediately send out a call for an international panel of scientists to begin to develop a plan to start the very difficult and very complex task of 
dismantling the nuclear arsenals. We must see that this happens now. It must begin to happen in Geneva, where last Wednesday, our government sat down with the Soviet government for arms talks at SALT II. We must insist that it happen at the United Nations. We must do all we can to see that it happens there. And we must call on scientists and civic and religious leaders and college presidents and committees of Congress, but most of all, we must call on all the women's organizations. For it is up to us, the women of America, to do what must be done to save our families, to save our children, and to save children everywhere, and to save our children's children. We will do it, and we can do it, because we must. We are strong. We know how to work together. And we are the ones who raise the children. We bear and we raise them, and we're the link to the future. We have the stamina, and we have the determination. And when we make up our minds to do something, we get it done. As individuals, and in following the program that Bella laid down here today, for women to increase their political power in government. Yes, even if it means what she mentioned. Just spending our time campaigning for women candidates who can take the action that is needed in the Congress. This is a very serious situation, and we must devote ourselves to it. We need more political power in order to see that this mess in the Congress, yes, in the Congress, and in the executive branch, which still exists, must be cleaned up. And we will start here today in our workshops. In our peace workshop, we'll begin to lay out a program of what can be done. Because a great deal can be done. It doesn't matter whether you're an individual and you stay at home with your children. There's a great deal you can be doing. If you work, if you're in political action, whatever you're doing, there's a great deal that you can do every single day to change this situation. We can do it, and we will do it. I've run out of time. In fact, we've all run out of time. The nuclear clock has been moved ahead, and the scientists warn it is three minutes till midnight. I have uh, 14 announcements. We're right. This later from Cedar Falls. Nice town. <laughs> Before I have the honor of introducing our, our speaker, who has also come a long way, I think that occasionally it is important for us to remember people who are not here. In the community that I come from, a lot of young women had the opportunity throughout their lives to get to know a very special person who, if I remember correctly, was here last time, last year. She is not here today because she died about three weeks ago. There was a great woman in my community who uh, in the early years of the history of this state, decided that she wanted to be in political science. She decided that the, uh, the political processes of our state and nation needed her services. So she went to college and got a master's degree, and she decided that she would uh, persevere in that task. She was also a single woman. 
And, unfor and I know that many of you are single women, like I am a single woman. Someday we're going to have a workshop on the problems of the single woman, Roxanne. <laughs> right? <laughs> We have, you know, we have this triple discrimination, you know, we not only can't get a man and reproduce ourselves, you know, but we uh, are women and we have all the other things. Anyway, the woman that I'm talking about was a single woman. She finally became the first woman in the state of Iowa to head a political science department in one of our major in universities. I had the good fortune to talk with her a couple weeks before she died. And uh, we talked for a long time about her life and all the battles that she fought in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And the last thing that I remember her saying to me was, I chose to be single so that I can contribute in a different way. And she said, you know, Mary, I never apologized for that. And she was a woman who indeed did not ever apologize for her choices. Her name was Irma Plain, and she died recently. Were she alive or even willing to get or able to get around, she would have been here with us today. It is my pleasure at this time to, to introduce a very important person in the political structure of our country right now. Presidential Counselor Ann Armstrong announced recently that Patricia Sullivan Lynn would be joining her staff as Special Assistant to the Counselor for Women's Programs. In making the announcement, Mrs. Armstrong said, she, Pat, brings both interest and experience in women's concerns and freshness and vitality to the office. Mrs. Lynn was one of the founders of the Women, women in Politics, which is now affiliated with the Louisiana National Women's Political Caucus. She has previously served as first vice president and is currently a member of the board of that organization. She currently serves as Republican National Committee Woman for the state of Louisiana. Great. <laughs> But she but will resign this position in order to devote full time to her White House duties. I hope you have a feminist to replace you, Pat. <laughs> she was a delegate and a member of the platform committee of the Republican National Convention in 1972. She is a member of the Horizons Committee of the Baton Rouge Bicentennial Commission. She has a very interesting background in, uh, outside of our country also. I'd like to share some of those facts with you. While living abroad from 1955 to 65, she was editor of the Singapore American newspaper. She was founding president of the International Women's Club in Kuwait, member of the board of the American Association of Singapore, and the Women's Club in Karachi, Pakistan. Pat's civic and organizational activities include membership in the American Association of University Women, Board of Trustees of the Louisiana Arts and Science Center, Chairman of the Women's Division of the United Givers, Louisiana Historical Society, the Arts Council of Baton Rouge, and the Government Committee of the Baton Rouge Goals Congress. Pat Lynn was born in Toledo, Ohio. What is it about Ohio that produced Pat Lynn and Gloria Steinem and all these wonderful people? Pat resides in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with her husband Robert and three children. And she is a graduate of Fine Women's College, Trinity College in Washington, D.C. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Pat Lind from the White House. Thank you, Mary, very much. And thanks especially to you, Roxanne, for inviting me here today on this first anniversary of the founding of the Iowa Women's Political Caucus. And a special word of thanks to Molly Gaylord, who has been a very first-class tour guide, and I appreciate it very much. Molly, wherever you, there you are, <laughs> sitting down at long last. I have to bring that thing up to date, as a matter of fact. I don't live in Baton Rouge anymore. I'm kind of a member of a really a feminist group. When I was appointed to this job in Washington, my husband and my three children followed me for a change. <laughs> and moved to Washington with me. I figured I'd traipsed around the world with him. It was time he did me a favor after 19 years. So they're all there now, and Bob is babysitting this weekend, and we are living examples that it can be done. 
Um, also, I'm hatched. I'm no longer National Committee woman or any of those things because the day I signed on with my um, Form 171, I did two things. I resigned from politics and I hope I began to put a price tag on volunteerism. <laughs> I'd been volunteering for 19 years. Ten of it abroad and nine of it in Louisiana politics. And believe me, when you're a Midwesterner, Republican, feminist in the state of Louisiana, you should have earned something for all of that. <laughs> so when I formed, filled out my Form 171, my last previous job was 19 years ago. My salary was $52.50 a week, and it threw everybody into a tailspin, because what do you do about that? You know, how do you pay somebody? I mean, that's illegal. I wasn't even making minimum wage. So I filled out my job things, which went way back, and then I looked at those other 12 pieces of paper empty, and I said, the heck with this. And I listed every major volunteer job that I had held, complete with total job descriptions, the number of people that I'd su supervised, the whole bit, and I put in figures I thought I was worth. I got paid for it, by the way. <laughs> Although I am a Midwesterner from Chicago, I've only been to your Sunflower State once before, 20 years ago, visiting a college friend in Davenport. It was too long ago, I must admit, and I hope you'll all invite me back someday to see more of it. But I'm glad to be here in the center of the state, see Des Moines, and to see this beautiful university. In Louisiana, by the way, I live two blocks from LSU. And um, I feel that living in a university town particularly is exciting and nowadays more exciting than ever before because, as you know, much of the women's movement was founded in university towns. So you've got something to be proud of if you're from Ames. I also am glad that I wear a size 10 shoe because today I'm filling a couple of pairs of big ones. I replaced Jill at the White House. Jill was working part-time and um, we decided women needed more than part-time work, they needed full-time work. Jill has five children and I only have three, so that took care of that. They figured I could make it full-time. Jill still is in Washington, works with me very closely on many, many things, and sends you all her very, very best greetings today. And the other pair of shoes I'm filling is somebody of whom I am very, very proud. And that's Mary Louise Smith. Her election as chairman of the Republican National Committee last week was really a significant event for women of all, all over this country of ours, but more particularly for all of you. She was a member of your caucus, a resident of your state, one of the leading forces of politics in the state of Louisiana, I mean of Iowa, and now she is going to lead the country. And as a woman in that job, I know, you know Mary Louise well enough that she's going to do one heck of a job for the Republican Party, but more importantly for women of both major political parties in the years to come. And now I want to congratulate all of you. This is your first birthday, really. And I've been sitting up in the press room most of this morning listening to what the reporters up there had to say about you. And they are amazed. <laughs> Evidently, a year ago, they came for uh, sensationalism, for, oh, fun and games to see what all the girls were talking about and what was <laughs> making everything go. They thought it was a joke and a party. Up there, an hour ago, we started talking about power. And that is what's happened in Iowa in the past year. And that is what you see in this room today. And one of the reporters was trying to write about it, trying to find the words to describe this. And I said, on a football weekend, on a beautiful Saturday, at this time of the year, to get this many women in one room together is something special. And it really comes down to a five-letter word. It's power. And I want you to use it. I'm
I'm going to beat along because at 2 o'clock you all go to work. So I'm going to just zip through this and tell you some things that I'm thinking about. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a story. In 1638, a 37-year-old spinster named Margaret Brent left England, a manor house, money and comfort, and came to the United States for her political beliefs, for religious freedom. She moved to Maryland. And on her arrival, the Lord, Lord Baltimore broke with tradition and assigned to her, a woman, her own manorial rights and a land grant. In nine years, this woman became an enormous power in the colony of Maryland. About that time, William Claiborne, who was secretary of the colony of Virginia, claimed part of Maryland and sent a military forces to invade the province. I might say now that I lived up there, over there, wherever it is, there's still having these problems today. <laughs> Governor Calvert of Maryland fled before the invaders. And when he came back to put them down, he was dying. And he called, of all the people in the state of Mar or the colony of Maryland, he called in Margaret Brent and told her to take over. He said, take all and pay all. And he died. And she moved. There was famine. The soldiers were in a state of mutiny. There were back pay problems. The people were in a state of revolt. The Lord Proprietor gave Margaret Brent his power of attorney. And this middle-aged woman arranged to pay the army to repel the troops, and uh, to fix up the troops, pay their back salary, and send them out to repel the inv invasion. She saved Maryland. And obviously feeling that her political achievements should give her some political equality, she appeared before the assembly. And these are the, the words of the clerk of the assembly in 1640. Came Mistress Brent and requested to have vote in the house for herself and voice also. It was ordered that the said Mistress Brent was to be looked upon and received as his lordship's attorney the governor denied that the said Mistress Brent should have any vote in the House. And Mistress Brent protested against all proceedings in this present assembly unless she should have been present and have her vote record recorded. That was the end of the very first attempt by a woman to achieve equal suffrage on the American continent. It took 272 years for the descendants of Margaret Brent to achieve her goal. And along the way, a number of marvelous women made their way into the pages of history. Fifteen years ago and 20 years ago, they wouldn't have been in the history books. But you know doggone well they're beginning to get in the history books today, and that's part of the story. Lucretia Mott made $8 a month for teaching school. Her male peers made $30 a month. She joined forces with Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1848 to call to order the first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And she railroaded through a resolution there which became the basis for the women's movement. It said, resolve that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to elective franchise. There was Susan B. Anthony and the shy Lucy Stone who could transfix an audience when she turned it on. Lucy and her sisters worked the farm so their one brother could go to college. And uh, it was said that he had the look, looks and she had the brains. And everybody said, wasn't that a pity? <laughs> they didn't know Lucy. She also, when she got married to a man named Mr. Blackwell, kept her maiden name. She had worked for it, she earned it, and she kept it. There was Anna Shaw, the Reverend Olympia Brown, and Alice Paul, who introduced some modern techniques to the cause, the sit-in and the march. Everything is old history. In the end, they discovered that political pressure tipped the scales. That's what it was all about. In 1920, women won the vote, and the long fight was over. Or was it? Forty years went by with very little activity. Be, but behind the scenes, we began to gather together, a few here, a few there. We talked about the law. We talked about child care. We talked about tenure. We talked about divorce and support. We talked about a lot of things. A dozen issues brought us together. Rosie the Riveter had exposed millions of women to the benefits of the paycheck. Rosie was gone, but her memory lingered on. 
And in the early 1960s, a new group of women leaders burst on the scene. Betty Friedan wrote a book. You know what it was. It was a testament, really. It was called The Feminine Mystique. It appeared in 1962. It rose to the top of the charts, and it stayed there. It was read by millions of women, tapping their discontent, opening new possibilities, and raising their consciousness. Joining Betty were Gloria Steinem, Germaine Greer, Kate Millett, and other writers, feminist writers. What is a feminist? Is it a burn the bra, ban the baby, bomb the men's bars type of thing? <coughs> By dictionary definition, a feminist is one who believes in political, social, and economic equality of the sexes. That's all, and that's it. All the rest is frosting on the cake or water in the basement, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> you all know what happened next, because history is repeating itself. History always does. We've read the books. We've met. We've talked. We've argued. Sure we have. We've discussed. We've marched, just like Alice Paul, 50 years ago, and we sat in. Nothing is new under the sun. And one thing we found out, which is what they found out, is where it's really at, and it's in politics, period. It's in bringing pressure to bear on your legislators. It's in campaigning against those who won't support us, and actively and wholeheartedly campaigning for those who do. It's in lobbying, an art you all should master. And I think one of your workshops this afternoon will be on that. And I, re I, hope, I didn't look ahead, but maybe they'll repeat it. And I really urge you to go to that. And most of all, it's getting women elected to the school boards, the city councils, the legislatures, and to the Congress of the United States of America. You have a much better chance of changing the rules when you're a member of the team. And you know many of the team captains. Some of them you've been fortunate enough to meet this weekend. Some I hope you'll meet before too long. Sissy Farenthold, your national president. Bella Opsug, who delivered the address this morning and a great one last night, I understand. Peggy Heckler and Martha Griffith. And your own very outstanding Mary Louise Smith. If the laws of this land are to reflect your concerns and your interests, then many, many more of you must become lawmakers. Bella and Roxanne both mentioned some statistics here this morning on the number of candidates we have around the country. And although we have around 46 or 47 women running for Congress, I wish we had more, and I sure wish we had one in Iowa. Although we have three candidates running for governor, I wish we had more. And although we have four candidates running for lieutenant governor, I wish we had more. And someday, soon, we will have more, and they'll win. <laughs> Bella told you about the woman defeating the legislator in the state of Missouri who bottled up the ERA for so many years. That's how it's done, ladies. In Indiana, where the amendment has been voted down twice, 25 women made it through the primaries to carry a major party designation in November in their races for the state legislature. Only nine women hold seats there now. That's power. And have you heard about our girl in Nevada? <coughs> I wonder if you have.